Hey everyone, on today's clip I want to talk about how I analyze a property and run you through what I do and what my thought process is on doing that. So as you can see here I got a basic layout in either an Excel or technically this is Numbers, the, app, the Apple version of this. But it's very simple, I've just given some titles in place and put some um, bold and some dress it up a bit but this isn't anything special you guys can all learn how to do this not hard whatsoever uh, there's a couple here the cap rate and the income to debt ratio i usually don't calculate when i'm doing my analysis but i wanted to include them so we could talk about them a little bit but let's just run through it okay so let's say we have a hundred thousand dollar house and i have the property in this 539 lake street just put your property address so you know what you're dealing with here can be anything. Um, $100,000 house. Let's say we're not doing any repairs, but what would go in here is if you had a construction loan, say you're putting $20,000 into the house, you would put this here. For our sake, we're going to say there's no repairs. So the total would be your purchase plus your repairs. That is your total debt or investment into this property. Next is your rent. To find your rent, if you don't know your market, and you won't starting out, do your research. Look at other property management companies in the area. Research their website. Look at within a half mile, mile of your house, comparable properties, and the rent should be about the same as what you can expect. Also, look at websites like rent.com, apartments.com, Zumper, Zillow, things like that and you will be able to find pretty close what your market rent should be. And that should go here. Let's say that this house is going to get $1,250 a month in rent. Next is the utilities included in your gross rent. So I have this $1,250. It's a big difference if the, all the utilities are included, right? That rent number goes down. For most of my leases, we only include garbage in our lease. We cover that. We have a large contract with the waste management company. And I know that boils down to be right about $18 a month for a unit or a single family home. Caveat to this, if you are including or say you are buying a property and you're inheriting a lease from the seller, you need to look over that lease and see what is included in account for that. If gas and electric is in there, you need to call the local provider and find out what that is. In a lot of my markets, a lot of my properties, the provider is XL Energy. I call XL Energy, give them the property address, and they will give me the average monthly bill over the last 12 months. Include that here. Okay? So you can do your homework to figure these things out. Water. You can look that up with the city. What are the water month or uh, quarterly payments or bills? What are they coming to? All that stuff you can look up and it needs to be put in here. But again, I usually just include garbage. Insurance. A rule of thumb for insurance that I've learned that was passed down to me by a friend and mentor is you take the total price of the property divided by $2,000 to arrive at your monthly premium. And it comes out to $50 even here. I will say, now that I've kind of dialed this in, I would say this is a little bit conservative and on the high side. For a $100,000 property, I would guess that the monthly premium would come in right around $40 to $45 a month. But let's be conservative. Let's leave the 50 Next is the mortgage tab. What these numbers up here mean, and they're just me, for, for me, you can use your own code or system. The 5.05 means that's my annual percentage rate. And the slash and then the 20 means on a 20-year amortization. And those are the two metrics you really need to know. So if I calculate that, and I simply do it on a phone app that I have, but you can find it online or download any app to figure this out, I come up with a monthly mortgage payment of 662.72. Now, a caveat to that is I am accounting for 100% of the debt, so all 100,000, because I was always taught that that money had to come from somewhere and it has a cost. Even if you are coming into this property and paying $20,000 and getting an $80,000 mortgage, 
that $20,000 that you allocated from your own pocket came at a cost. Um, what else could you have been doing with that money? What other kind of investments and returns? So you should allocate that and think about that cost. As you get further down, you'll be pulling equity from properties to make purchases on other properties, and you are paying 100% debt service no matter how you do that. So I think it's just a good process to always allocate for 100% debt service. That covers you everywhere. If it's not 100%, then your cash flow simply goes up. That's a good thing. So I always just account for 100%. Taxes, super simple. Go on your municipality's website, look up tax history, type in the property address. It'll give you the most recent year's tax bill. Right now it's 2018. Let's say that this property has a $2,100 tax bill in 2018. So I want to get everything on my monthly expenses. Sorry, I should have prefaced this. This is monthly, all these expenses and incomes, just so you know. So if I want to get taxes down to the monthly, I'd say equals, hit the tax, divide by 12. That gives me it's $175 a month that taxes are costing me. The last two categories are maintenance and management. So for maintenance, I was taught a long time ago to allocate 10% of gross rent towards maintenance. And this will cover your day-to-day -day things that come up like screens, uh, chips in the wall, etc., etc. But it will also allocate and set money aside for larger expenses such as appliances, furnaces, water heaters, even a roof. This should cover a lot of that, if not all of it. So how I calculate this is I take my gross rent and I times it by 0.1 to get to 10% of that. Pretty simple calculation. Probably could have done it in your head, but it's $125. My management, and again, you should research your whatever your management is going to be. Sit down with property managers, determine which one you're going to use. It's usually a percentage of the gross rent. For instance, a lot of my stuff is at 6%. So again, I'd hit, and that's of gross rent. So gross rent, the $12.50 times .06, we arrive at $75. That is the monthly property management fee I would be paying. If you're starting out, you might be self-managing. That means this just turns into more cash flow. That's a good thing. However, I would strongly advise you to allocate and set money aside to pay yourself because you know, your time is valuable and you should account for that. Now, we've got everything kind of set up now. Now we just do some simple calculations to determine if this investment is a good one and fits our metrics, whatever they may be. I like to immediately determine the cash flow of the property. Again, I've mentioned that I invest for cash flow. That's all I really want to know. Is it going to cash flow? Is it going to sustain itself and possibly give me a little bit of extra passive income? So, I can maybe use that to pay some of my personal expenses. So how to calculate cash flow, very simple. Monthly income minus monthly expenses. We got one source of income. Take that minus all of our expenses, guys. So minus utilities, minus insurance, minus mortgage, minus taxes, minus maintenance, minus management. And we arrive at, after everything's paid off, Leftover at the end of each month will have $144.28. That's pretty pretty good. That's a pretty good cash flowing asset. And this is pretty standard from what I see in the markets I invest in. That's pretty standard. Now, if you're self-managing, the $75 gets added to that. In most months, the taxes and the maintenance, because a lot of times there's not big maintenance costs. Maybe you had $20 in maintenance this month those will just go into cash flow as well. But you need to be cognizant that when it's time to have one of those big expenses or to pay for the annual taxes, you need to have that money set aside. So as this, the cash in your bank account grows a lot quicker than, say, $144 a month, don't go spend that. That is allocated already to these two buckets. You need to be cognizant of that. That is basically what I do. This is it. Now, there's a lot more analysis that you'll see from a lot of other people. I'm just a simple guy, and I like to, to know if my property was going to sustain itself currently, and I would just assume that things would get better in the future, right? Is rent going to go up or down in the future? 
probably going to go up. And sure, a lot of these other little buckets will go up as well. But my big one, my debt service, probably won't. It gets locked in if you have long-term financing. might even go down if interest rates go down. So as rent goes up in the future, more and more of that is going to get deposited in my cash flow bucket. So I never took the time to see where it's going to be three, five, ten years from now. All I wanted to know is, is this thing self-sustaining? Is this asset, this investment self-sustaining and possibly giving me some cash flow at the end of all the expenses being paid? That's the basic question I ask myself when I'm doing an investment. And you can take that or leave that. That's what I do. Now, a lot of people, this cap rate right here, a lot of people like to use a cap rate to calculate things. And I'll show you how to do that, and then I'll give you my take on cap rates and why I don't use them. So calculate the cap rate, you say equal. I'm going to put a parenthesis here. We are going to say we need to figure out our income before debt service. We have our income. We're going to minus all of our expenses but not our mortgage payment. So everything but that. All right, that gives you our monthly, but for the cap rate, we need to times that by 12 for the 12 months of the year to get an annual income before debt service. And we're gonna divide that by the total property price, the total amount we're into the property for. That comes out to 9.68. This is a 9.68% cap rate. That's what this investment has. The reason I don't use this, and I would say that I'm in the minority of this, this is a, a term that gets thrown around a lot in commercial real estate, is it doesn't account for this. And for me, this is my biggest expense. This assumes that people are buying property 100% cash. And I don't know when that is ever the case. You, if you buy a property with 100% cash, you are eliminating a lot of the benefits that real estate has from leverage, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't like this because I invest for cash flow. Let's say that in five years, the interest rates, as they've been climbing, are now at 7%. Or let's say 7.25. So let me do a quick calculation here at 7.25. Still on a 20-year AM. Well, my monthly payment now goes up to $790.38. Let's plug that into our cash flow as our new mortgage payment. Let's take out the old one, and now we're going to plug the new one in. Our cash flow now goes down to 16.62%. Or sorry, $16.62 a month. That's a huge deal to me. That is not something I want. However, look at our cap rate. It stayed the same because it doesn't account for this. Fluctuations in mortgage and interest rates. That, to me, is a huge deal and why I never do this. I don't care if it's a 9 cap, a 6 cap, a 7 cap. It, de it depends. Everything has its day. Back in 2008, 10, 11, 12, 13, when interest rates are at 3.5%, a 9 cap to me meant a lot different than a 9 cap means to me today when interest rates are right around 5. And they'll be a lot different to me when they're at 7 or 8. So to me, the sole fact that, that this doesn't calculate or account, I should say, for the mortgage payment is why I do not use it. And you can use it, and I, I would again say I am in the minority of that, but I think that is a huge deal, and it boils down to back to my basic of does this cash flow, can I make the payments every month? But this is a number that you'll see thrown around a lot. One other one I want to throw out to you that banks look at a lot is the income to debt ratio. The banker comes to you and says, we'll only finance properties that are a 1.2 income to debt ratio. What does that mean, right? So income to debt ratio, pretty simple. So we put equal our income, and then we divide, and we need to add up all of our monthly debts or payments, let's say. And we do include the mortgage in on this. One thing I don't know is maintenance, how banks include this. It's probably their own secret formula. 
Do they just include all 125? Probably not. They probably have like a, hey, it's probably 7 or 8% of gross rent, not the full 10. But let's just include it anyways, just for the sake of this calculation. So we add up all those, close our parentheses, equal. This has an income to debt ratio of 1.13. So if the banker said we need a 1.2, this would not pass that. And you would need to find something with a better ratio. How you do that, and you can play with this now that it's in there. Let's say we go up to 1350 raise rent $100. We're looking good now. Now we're at a 1.2 and everything passes. Even our cap rate went up. Went up. You can kind of play with this and see what you need to pass that metric. But it's something that banks look at very carefully and a lot of times come up on annual reviews and our covenants of mortgages. You need to watch that. One thing that I was brought up on in the last calculation I'll show you is called the gross rent multiplier. It's what I use over more of, more often than a cap rate. Gross rent multiplier, simple calculation. You take your monthly rent. Oops, sorry. Did that wrong. Total cost of the property divided by your monthly rent. Comes out to 80. It would be called 80x or 80 times. So you pay for a property 80 times the monthly rent is what that means. And each market has different metrics. Every market that I invest in, and there's about three main ones, has a different benchmark gross rent multiplier. The main market I used to invest in, it was always taught to me that if you bought something for 80 times, 85 times or lower, gross rent multiplier, so this number equals 85 or less, you were doing pretty good, and that was a safe metric. However, I'm in different markets now, and that is not translating. And we're finding that some other markets are even better, I guess, quote unquote, where you can get stuff for 75 times, and that should be your benchmark. So you need to figure out whatever that is, but it allows you to do a quick calculation in your head when you look at a sale price, and you look at, you know, you can look at the monthly rent on an MLS sheet, et cetera, et cetera. And you should be able to calculate that off the top of your head to see if it's worth running this analysis. Those are, again, minus these two a lot of times. I don't do these. This is the analysis I do, guys, or I did definitely starting off. I will say that my analysis has gotten a little bit more in depth now. And I look at kind of projections into the future. I'm playing with some IRR tables, um, internal rate of return tables, I should say, lay that out. But I just wanted to know... Could I make payments? That's all this bill boils down to. And would this add to my passive income, my passive cash flow? That's all I ask. And I would set a metric to this. Say this is one unit. I would always ask for, say, $120 or $100 a month in cash flow per unit. That would pass this metric. However, maybe the bank wouldn't allow this because it's a 1.1 income to debt ratio. So there's different things that play into this, but... I would have taken this cry to a bank and been okay with purchasing this asset. But that's how I lay it out. Very simple. The big thing I don't see people doing is doing their homework and their due diligence. Taking the time to lay out these numbers to the penny. And you should be able to get that down to the penny. These all came out big and beautiful, right? Because this, this number was good. And then I made this number even. This won't be even when you look up the municipality. So this will have some weird scent to it. The insurance is a rough calculation. Again, you can price this out with your insurance, your insurance company and get the actual monthly payment. You can get all this stuff. I see people skimp on this all the time from the utilities companies. Figure out what those costs are, guys, and you can get an accurate cash flow per month. That's how I do it. That's how I started off doing it. That is still the basic analysis I do to determine if a property is a good investment. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than that, in my opinion. Others will say differently, but that's what I do. Any questions, guys, feel free to reach out. Cheers.